हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर राजीव जैन फ्रॉम जिवाजी यूनिवर्सिटी ग्वालियर टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट ए मॉड्यूल बाय टेक्नोलॉजिकल मेथड्स इन पॉल्यूशन अबेटमेंट अंडर द पेपर एनवायरमेंटल बायोटेक्नोलॉजी तो फॉर टुडेज लेक्चर लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव आर एप्लीकेशन ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी इन द रिडक्शन ऑफ कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एमिशन फोटोसिंथेसिस एज ए मीन्स ऑफ रिड्यूसिंग कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एमिशन एल्गल फोटोसिंथेसिस इन वेस्ट वाटर ट्रीटमेंट ऑक्सीजन प्रोडक्शन बाई एलगी यूट्रोफिकेशन एलगी एल्गल बायोमास एंड बायोलॉजिकल फॉस्फोरस रिमूवल बायोलॉजिकल फॉस्फोरस रिमूवल फ्रॉम वेस्ट वाटर मेटल मेटल पॉल्यूशन एंड इट्स अबेटमेंट मेटल पॉल्यूशन एंड इज बायो अबेटमेंट प्लांट्स इन प्लांट्स इन एक्वेटिक मेटल पॉल्यूशन अबेटमेंट ऑल दीज थिंग्स वी शेल स्टडी टूडे दीज आर टूडेज अवर लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव हाउ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी कैन हेल्प इन डिफरेंट वेज वी शेल ऑल्सो स्टडी सेल इमोबिलाइजेशन एज ए टूल इन वेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट टेक्निक्स ऑफ इमोबिलाइजेशन वी शेल ऑल्सो स्टडी एनवायरमेंटल एप्लीकेशन ऑफ immobilized cells we in various ways as you have studied that for water treatment we use different types of technology it may be chemical technology today we shall study applications of biotechnological in water treatment so first we shall study application of biotechnology in the application of in the application of reduction of carbon dioxide emission increase in the concentration of carbon carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has become a great issue how carbon dioxide concentration has increased in the environment how it can be reduced because it is causing different types of problem it is causing global warming it is due to which temperature might be increasing it is probably linked with the rise in atmospheric temperature causing the so called greenhouse effect the greenhouse effect gases include carbon dioxide methane chlorofluorocarbons and water vapor in the environment of these gases carbon dioxide is the principal agent which is which is believed that during last 150 years it is causing global warming and by the increase by the increase of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by, by about 25% may lead to the increase of overall temperature by 0.5% in the northern hemisphere and go, and may cause in general global warming in the present present, mo present model suggests that for a doubling of carbon dioxide level in the in the atmosphere global temperature can increase by about 1% 1 degree centigrade this would lead to the rise of sea levels erratic rainfall shifting of vegetation zones and their effects on agriculture in general this has led to the thinking of devising means of possible reduction of carbon dioxide emissions among the chemical approach the possibility of biotechnological reduction is also being thought of and investigated in different parts of the world as an alternative approach photosynthesis as a means of reducing carbon dioxide emissions photosynthesis by plants is considered to be an obvious means of energy efficient biotechnological reduction of carbon dioxide released from industrial exhaust the process can be summarized by the following equation in which n number of molecules of carbon dioxide reacts with n number of water molecule in the presence of sunlight and they form carbohydrates and they release oxygen and water in this respect the photosynthetic efficiency of both terrestrial and aquatic vegetation can be augmented higher plant photosynthesis 
rampant deforestation has resulted in the significant reduction of carbon dioxide sink. It has been estimated that about 1% of tropical rainforests are getting diminished every year. Their conservation is an urgent need and for that matter two approaches may be made. On the one hand, selection of fast growing trees and their propagation is being done and on the other, recourse to biotechnological methods like micro propagation and synthetic seed production through tissue cultures are attempted at different centers. Another biotechnological approach for genetic improvement of photosynthetic carbon dioxide fixation is also desirable. It is known that the enzyme RUBP case ribulose biphosphate carboxylate is the one responsible for carbon dioxide fixation by plants. In two subunits, large and small, are genetically controlled by nuclear and cytoplasmic genes. Attempts are already being made to genetically manipulate this enzyme in crop plants to increase the photosynthetic efficiency. Same approach could be made in forest trees at the tissue culture level before their propagation so that regenerated plants from culture would have more carbon dioxide fixation potential. Microalgal photosynthesis. Microalgal photosynthesis is an efficient mechanism for carbon dioxide reduction. If well digested, photobioreactor could be constructed for their intensive cultivation. Due to their high rate of photosynthesis, they appear to be good candidates in this respect. The photosynthetic quotient, which is the ratio of the release of oxygen to carbon dioxide fixed, is usually less than one for microalgae. This means that during the process they can generate more of oxygen than that of carbon dioxide consumed per unit biomass than in case of higher plants. Moreover, microalgae offer economics of scale as they can be grown by volume instead of area. So photobioreactors would be useful where cultivation can be made in cultures with artificial light and fiber optic light radiator. Several such reactor designs have been proposed and large scale continuous cultivations have been done with cholera, pyronocidosa and spirinolia maxima. It has been estimated that the amount of carbon dioxide released from a power plant of 150 megawatt capacity would require an algal culture volume of 15 into 10 raised to power 4 cubic meter. Moreover, such a huge microalgal biomass could be effectively utilized for extraction of protein as food and feed. It is known that both cholerilla and spirulina contain highest amount of protein per unit biomass among the plant kingdom. Industrially generated carbon dioxide is much higher than its normal level in the air. Carbon dioxide reduction from such high concentration would thus require algal forms or strains which can tolerate high carbon dioxide level up to 20%, for example, increased alcohol tolerance by yeasts. In this respect, genetic manipulation with chemical mutagens like ethylmethane, sulfonate or nitrosomethylurea and others yielding higher carbon dioxide tolerant mutants in anacytis nidulans and cyanococcus is encouraging. This has led to the discovery of a number of strains with higher carbon dioxide tolerance of other algae like chlorocum and ocetis. Alternatively, using gene cloning technique, that is genetic engineering, may perhaps be possible to develop strains with faster growth rate to yield larger biomass of the concerned algae. Next thing which you would like to study here, I will emphasize on the fact that reducing carbon dioxide emission 
from sea water through biological calcification is very important. Deep sea offers viable reservoir for long term storage of carbon dioxide. This is achieved with the help of calcifying organisms like corals and a number of calcareous green and red algae. They live in a symbiotic relationship and the calcification process is rapid. Water reacts with carbon dioxide in aqueous media and forms carbonic acid. This carbonic acid reacts with calcium present in the sea and forms calcium carbonate. If algal species can be found out which would tolerate high pH and carbonate, then photosynthesis by such algae may lead to precipitation of calcium carbonate. Another way by which carbon dioxide may be reduced is the algal photosynthesis in wastewater treatment. Wastewaters resulting from human activities are of municipal, agricultural and industrial origin. Because of the diversity of sources of these wastes, their characteristics also differ extremely. Primarily, they contain organic and inorganic substances, pathogenic organisms and various toxic materials like heavy metals. So the treatment of such wastes for purification is rather complex. The treatment processes may be principally categorized as physical and biological. The physical process consists of straining and settling. This cannot remove a major portion of organic matter which remain as colloidal and as dissolved solids. This can be achieved by what is called the phenomenon of mineralization of organic matter that is breaking down into simpler forms through bacterial oxidation or biodegradation. This process requires a steady supply of oxygen as the respiratory requirements of the bacteria flora in the waste. As is clear from the figure that here algal bacterial symbiosis in photosynthetic oxygenation has been depicted. In conventional biological practices, the oxygen is supplied artificially by continuous bubbling of the atmospheric air. Aerobic oxidation ponds or stabilization ponds are used throughout the world for such treatment, but it needs costly equipment and manpower. From the figure you can see how carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight is by algal photosynthesis is evolving oxygen and then this dissolved oxygen by bacterial oxidation form different types of organic sludge or mineralization can be achieved resulting in the formation of carbon dioxide, ammonia and phosphate ions. However, it was long known that simple microalgae can serve as the rich source of oxygen in fish ponds. This principle was first utilized in sewage treatment by Herman and Gloena in 1958. The algal system can supply the oxygen needed by the bacteria and protozoa in the process of degradation of organic contents of wastewater. It is a natural process and thereof no artificial aeration is necessary. The conventional treatment of sewage and other wastewaters consists of three phases, primary, secondary and tertiary. The algal treatment is introduced at the secondary stage where liquid effluent from the primary stage is taken care of and bio-oxidation takes place. Oxygen production by algae. The principle of photosynthesis is known as oxygen generator where carbon dioxide and water are used by plants to build carbohydrates and release oxygen in presence of sunlight. The photosynthetic efficiency of many microalgae is very high. Under satisfactory environmental conditions, with availability of sufficient sunlight, as in many tropical countries, the oxygen produced by these algae surpasses their own respiratory requirement. This surplus oxygen can be made available in oxygen pond by the culture of a specific algae. It is inexpensive and natural process. Oxygen production occurs 
concurrently with algal production. On the basis of weight, the oxygen production is 1.3 times the algal production. This has been termed as oxygen algal quotient. The oxygen is valuable for meeting the biological oxygen demand requirement of wastewater arising out of vigorous respiration of the bacterial flora due to decomposers. The efficiency of the purification process is judged by BOD removal capacity and the ultimate BOD of wastewater should not exceed the oxygen produced by algal photosynthesis. The production and consumption of oxygen should be balanced to ensure that some amount of dissolved oxygen is present at all times in the effluent. It has been found that if the oxygen factor, which is the ratio of the quantity of oxygen produced by algae and the quantity of oxygen required by the decomposition of bacteria is maintained at 1.5 to 1.6, high level of BOT removal can occur. Results show that about 80 to 90 percent BOD removal can be achieved in course of 30 days. Moreover, through this algal treatment, it is possible to precipitate some of the toxic substances like heavy metals from wastewater. This is due to the high negative charge on algal cell surface against the strong positive charges of heavy metal cations which get adsorbed and settle out. One of the problems associated with the use of algae in liquid wastewater is the separation of algal biomass after they have done their job. A portion of algal cells may die during the long retention time and may get settled at the bottom along with other particulates and thus create anoxic situation. This may be prevented with the use of surfactant and finally can be separated out by mechanical strainer. The conditions which are required to be satisfied for proper algal treatment of liquid waste are the presence of bright sunlight helping higher photosynthetic efficiency with a with higher oxygen production, a temperature below 35 degrees centigrade to prevent thermal inactivation of algal cells, a steady supply of carbon source to prevent pH increase and continuous slow stirring to prevent development of anoxic condition. Besides purification of wastewater, such pond could be a source of valuable byproducts. Algal cells rich in protein could serve as a food and feed or be used as manure. Being rich in dissolved oxygen, such ponds may well support fish life and the algal cells can serve as fish food. It could also be a means of recovering metals present in the waste as contaminant by way of algal cell surface adsorption. Thus, the whole process of algal treatment of wastewater is useful in various ways apart from the primary objective of purification and possible reuse of such water. This system also reduces the risk of large number of pathogenic microbes getting into the effluent as many of them either become dead or get settled at the bottom of the pond or are screened out along with the removal of a algal biomass. Here, yeah, another very important phenomenon, eutrophication. What is eutrophication? The word eutrophication is derived from the Greek word meaning rich, while eutrophic water refers to the stage at which it is enriched with undesirable organic or inorganic nutrients containing phosphorus and to a lesser extent nitrogen. Natural sources Natural sources are nitrogen and phosphorus cycles and man-made sources are agricultural and municipal waste containing fertilizers and detergent as casual agents. Undesirable amount of these elements in wastewater favor excessive algal growth and this led to eutrophication means what is eutrophication when the concentration of nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and other micronutrients increases in water, then 
due to the presence of these nutrients there is a algal growth there is a algal bloom and these algae this algal bloom is causes eutrophication this algal bloom causes depletion of oxygen why how depletion of oxygen when this excess of algae die then there is a large slump is there which is decomposed which is decomposed by taking oxygen uh, so it causes depletion of oxygen it consumes oxygen during its decomposition it causes foul smell through generation of sulfide and death of non resistant organisms it results in the colonization of such water by a particular group of organisms causes sedimentation and eventually gets filled with the resistant type such a situation has been termed as water bloom dissolved organic compound as a direct source of nutrient for huge algae for huge algal growth or through bacterial activities release more carbon dioxide favoring algal photosynthesis among the algal species members of microalgae microalgae for example cyanophyce blue green which is a blue green algae are per, are predominant different species of the genera like linebia microcytes anabinia elfenginium oscillobacteria are involved in the algal bloom at least 20 algae algal species are capable of forming blooms these species have gas vacuoles in their cells which help them to float and survive for varying periods of time in a dense bloom gradual oxygen deficiency results in its collapse this leads to further release of nitrogen and phosphorus and helps in the development of another bloom it has been termed as bloom succession in a mature bloom with excessive growth of the cyanophycian algae microcyte cystis originosa a reddish scum is produced seeing the scum from a distance one can predict that the lake or pond has undesirable amount of phosphorus thus it serves as an indicator species in coastal areas the so called brown tide is caused by a golden brown alga called oreococcus algae absorbs phosphorus and store it as polyphosphates within the cells phosphorus concentration above 6 ppm favors explosive growth it has become a global problem as ponds and lakes gradually turn into marshes which is why in many western countries phosphorus based detergent manufacturer is encouraged algae are considered to be a biological means of nitrogen and phosphorus removal which in turn also helps checking eutrophication apart from cyanophyce dinoflagellates like cereatium and streptomonas are also present in bloom in marine conditions dinoflagellates cause red or brown coloration of the sea centric diatoms and sea weeds like alva entermorpha cladophora gelidium etc have also been used for assessing eutrophication of water in marine environment models have been proposed for the prediction of eutrophication literature on eutrophication have been reviewed by porcella in 1978 such heavy growth of bloom algae releases endotoxin like lipopolysaccharides affecting fishes and birds and even causes some diseases among human beings such as gastroenteritis diarrhea nausea etc control of algae in eutrophic waters can be done chemically or biologically chemical means constitute the use of algae sites like copper sulfate sodium arsenate dichlorophenyl oxyacetic acid and dichloro naphthoquinone 
but all these increase the sludge volume from sedimentation. They can also be controlled with the use of cyanophagus. This has been found to be effective by number of such viruses such as LPP, A1, N1, AS1, etc. Also, these viruses being specific for blue-green algae and do not pose problem to other aquatic organisms, yet the dead algal cells may release toxins in water. How these nitrogen and phosphorus, particularly phosphorus, can be removed from wastewater because they cause algal bloom. These are the micronutrients, so they are, from their remover is essential from the water. As phosphorus is ecologically significant in algal production, its removal from aquatic bodies is essential to protect them from eutrophication. Usual practice is to precipitate them chemically with salts of calcium, iron, aluminium, and magnesium. With calcium salts, phosphorus is precipitated as hydroxy is precipitated at hydroxy appetite as shown in the following scheme that it is being precipitated by combining with calcium. However, the alternate method is the biological one and which is more important and this is biological one where phosphate metabolizing bacteria help in the process. The energy required for this is made available by the release of Phosphorus bond, phosphorus bond as polyphosphate in volutin granules in the bacterial protoplasm. The biophosphorus removal has the advantage that addition of chemicals can be avoided and it helps in the reduction of sludge volume. The principle of biological treatment uh, plant lies in the exposure of the organism to alternating anaerobic and aerobic conditions. This can be achieved with or without nitrogen removal when nitrogen removal is needed and anoxis, uh, an anoxis quantification be introduced in between. As shown in the following figure that you can see how anaerobic aerobic conditions are generated, how phosphorus and nitrogen can be removed the removal of which are very essential. In figure 2, biological release and uptake of phosphorus in alternating anaerobic and aerobic conditions have been shown. How denitrification takes place, how aerobic reactor and anaerobic reactor works. Under anaerobic conditions, transport and storage of simple organisms such as acetates, require energy which is obtained from polyphosphate reserves of the bacteria with release of phosphorus. While under subsequent aerobic stage, the organic matter is oxidized to produce energy and reaccumulation of phosphates into polyphosphates. The net effect is the excess of phosphorus in the bacterial cell as shown in the figure 3. Figure 3 represents a model for phosphorus removal in bacteria through anaerobic and aerobic metabolism, it shows how the available carbon sources, carbon reserves, polyphosphate, how they metabolize it and energy is produced and how car oxygen is utilized. The possibility of removal of nitrates from wastewater with the use of immobilized cells of the bacterium Pseudomonas fluorescence in a continuous process has been shown a combination of biophosphorus removal with simultaneous chemical precipitation is likely to achieve low effluent phosphorus concentration. A flow sheet for the process is being shown in, in the next slide where how by using anaerobic, aerobic and clarify how different types of process is operating and how without nitrification, also without nitrification and with nitrification, the process is taking place. The next problem is the how to reduce metal pollution and how metal is removed from polluted bodies. 
metals and metalloids are ubiquitous in the biosphere. Rapid industrial development, on the other hand, is gradually redistributing them. Though some of the metallic ions are essential for the continuation of life processes, yet others are known to be harmful at various concentrations to living organisms, including men. They are a unique group of toxicants which are not normally amenable to either degradation or conversion to non-toxic form. There is thus a great concern about their concentrations in the environment. This is particularly so with respect to the so-called heavy metals. Although no specific definition has been attributed to these groups of metals, they are normally referred to as having a density higher than 5. Some of them in higher concentrations may even cause cancer. Cadmium has now blacklisted with lead and mercury in this respect. Heavy metals are considered to be a major field of interest by environmental scientists and engineers alike as they are increasingly polluting the air, water and soil environment. They are highly toxic to the living systems and some might cause cancer in the long run even when injected in very low concentrations. Biomagnification is a phenomenon where the metal absorbed by organisms at the lower tropical level of food chain gradually get more concentrated in those organisms which are at the higher levels where man is ultimate victim. At the highest tropic level of food chain, man is there, so gradually concentrated metal ions enter human body causing maximum damage. Biomethylation, on the other hand, involves the transfer of methyl group from organic compounds to metals primarily due to the microbial activities in the soil and water. Through this process, some metallic ions get detoxified, yet others turn into more hazardous forms due to the methyl conjugations. Methylated arsenic is less toxic than arsenic, but methyl mercury is more toxic than the metallic ion itself. Some of the microbes associated with the biomethylation of metals are candida and methanobacterium for arsenic, E. coli for mercury, and pseudomonas for cadmium and lead. Emissions of toxic oxides into the air is the main source of heavy metal for pollution. Emission of lead from auto automobiles account for two-thirds of global inputs. While soils and waters are considered as sinks of toxic metals, in soils they being immobile accumulate in topsoil and contaminate crops. In aquatic systems, the sources are industrial discharges, sewage, metal mining, effluent smelting, etc. Other sources include acid rays. Conventional physicochemical techniques including precipitation, ion exchange, etc. were not only refined and stepped up, but efforts were also directed towards the evolving suitable alternate biotechnological protocol. Biosystems approach has not only helped in better understanding of the mechanism of metal toxicity and detoxification and devise effective mitigation measures, but has also opened up the possibility of utilizing these bio-impacts as pollution monitoring parameters. Many of the aquatic plants, including phytoplanktons and benthics, are gradually showing up their unique absorption potential of metals from the bathing media and thus act as natural bioscavengers of effluent. The recovery of metals is facilitated when dead or immobilized biomass is used as a sorbent in the adsorption process rather than absorption. Biotechnological processes in general involves the use of biocatalysts either in the form of specific enzymes or whole cell organisms. The same holds good not only in industrial processes but also in the arena of environmental management. Immobilization of such biocatalysts particularly the microbial whole cell system and possibility of their repeated use has opened up new avenues in pollution abatement. Either the naturally occurring biodegrading microbes or their genetically improved counterparts can be maintained in substantially unchanged form to have continued expressions 
of biological activity and effectivity inside bioreactors through this novel technique. Advantages of cell immobilization. The immobilized cells offer considerable advantages over free cell suspension, which lie in the recovery and reuse, avoiding wash out of cells during operations, protection against extreme pH and temperature of the medium and toxic pollutant, possibility of easy separation from bathing solutions or reactors, function of cellular multi-enzyme systems simultaneously to augment effectively we are needed against the use of single enzyme and to have a continuous process operation in biological reactors. So students, today <coughs> we have learned how by using different biotechnological approaches we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we can suitably convert into useful products, how we can remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the water, wastewater, which causes algal bloom, which causes eutrophication and ultimately pool is converted into de dead pool. So avoiding that, we should remove nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients from wastewater and this can be removed by biotechnological modes. So in this module, in this lecture, you have studied the removal of nitrogen and phosphorus micronutrients from the wastewater and also maintaining the or removing the or treatment of carbon dioxide using different types of biotechnological approach by converting carbon dioxide into useful products.